Hello, welcome to this series of lectures about survey research in the digital age. This is the first lecture in a series of five. The first four lectures cover the material in chapter three of Bit by Bit, and the fifth of the five lectures covers material that is additions and extensions to what's in Bit by Bit. So to place the, this work about surveys in context, if you'll recall, previous parts of Bit by Bit have talked about uh, working with ready-made big data sources like Duchamp's Fountain. Now we're gonna make the transition to talking about custom-made data, where we'll see researchers play a much greater role in creating the data. And so you can think of this as a transition from the previous talk about ready-mades to a talk about custom-mades. And in fact, we'll see that this line is not a bright line, and in fact, some of the best work combines ready-made and custom-made data. So a few notes about my teaching. First is I have an anti-status quo bias. I think it's possible for me to come here and tell you what people generally believe, but I don't think that's the best way for you to learn. So sometimes I'll take some kind of contrary positions that some people might disagree with, and that's okay. That, I think, helps promote learning. The second is I'll have an anti-formality bias. Um, there, a lot of the things that I'll say are possible to say in a very technical way, and I have chosen not to do that in this lecture because I don't think this is the right format for technicality. Um, but format, formality is very important, and um, to get more of that, you can read bit by bit, and especially the materials that are recommended in the, the What to Read Next section. And also, this will be very brief, and much more information is in bit by bit. Okay, so I want to start off with a claim, which is that we need surveys even in the digital age. So the, the reason why I'm making this claim is I've sometimes heard people say, oh, I hate surveys. They're such bad uh, research instruments, like what people say depends on exactly how you ask them, and sampling is really hard, and people don't remember, and people lie to you, and there's all these problems with surveys, and plus who likes being in a survey anyway? So the digital age is gonna eliminate the need for surveys. That's a claim. I wanna argue that that's not true. And in fact, I wanna make an even stronger claim is that we need surveys, especially in the digital age. So in fact, I think the more digital age research that happens, I think the greater the need we'll see for surveys because they have nice complementary properties. They can do things that big data sources can't do, um, just in the same way that big data sources can do things that surveys can't do. So I wanna talk a little bit now about why I think we will always need to ask questions even in the age of big data. So the first is the limitation of uh, big data sources. So one way I like to think about this is um, there, when I was in uh, growing up, there was a company called FUBU and it's for, they make clothes and it stands for for us, by us. And I think the key idea here in terms of computational social science is that Big data sources are nufu nubu. They are not for us and they are not by us. And so let me explain what I mean a little bit more. So as a social scientist, I'm often interested in knowing things about people like their race ethnicity. But if I'm working at a company, that's actually something I probably don't wanna know about people. Likewise, if I'm working at a company, I probably really wanna know people's credit card numbers. But if I'm a, as a social scientist, that's not something I wanna know because storing that information puts a lot of extra burden and responsibility on me. And so I think fundamentally the kinds of information that companies want and governments wanna collect and the kinds of information that researchers wanna collect, sometimes there's an overlap and when that happens, we're lucky, but oftentimes there's not an overlap. And so I think the opportunities for data that are not collected by researchers and that are not collected for research are always gonna be limited. Another important reason why we'll always need to ask people is the difference between internal states and external states. So external states are things that you do, they're your behavior. How many times did you go to the doctor in the last month or how many cups of coffee did you drink today? Internal states are different. These are things like your knowledge, attitudes, expectations for the future. And it's often very difficult to infer people's internal states from their external states. And often social scientists care about internal states. Internal states are often things that we are interested in trying to understand better, like people's expectations for the future, or they could be things that we think are important predictors or explainers of external states. And so I think given the need for internal states, 
uh, both as a thing we try to explain and a thing that can help explain other things, I think we'll, all, we'll continue to need to ask people to learn about these internal states. And the final reason why we'll always, I think, need to ask people questions is the inaccessibility of big data. So uh, I've heard that the US National Security Agency has a humongous data center in Utah. And so, well, supposedly this data center has all of your electronic digital exhaust. It supposedly has all of your emails, all of your phone calls, all of your tweets. Does it really have all that? I don't know. Uh, it probably has a lot of stuff. And so you could say, wow, this is an amazing, look how great big data is. We can get all this information about all these people aggregated and linked up in one place. But for our purposes as researchers, that doesn't really matter because we're not gonna have access to the uh, National Security Agency's Utah Data Center. It's a highly classified facility and we're not gonna have access to the data in it. And so lots of big data sources are controlled by companies or governments. And even if that data could be really useful for research, we are often not going to be able to get access to it. And so for that reason, we're often going to have to collect our own data. And one way to collect your own data is through surveys. So for these three reasons, I think we're always need, going to need to ask people questions and do survey research, even in the age of big data. But how we're going to ask it should change because we can take advantage of the capabilities of the digital age. And so one way to think about the future of survey research is to look actually to the past of survey research. So um, survey researchers generally split the field up into three eras. So the first era started around the 1930s. And the main and, and what way previous researchers think about an era of survey research by the techniques that were used for sampling and the techniques that were generally used for interviews. So in this first era of surveys, the most typical thing was an area probability sample where you would split up, a, let's say, a city into a bunch of different um, areas like census blocks or city blocks. You would randomly pick uh, some of those uh, areas and then you would go to those areas and conduct face-to-face -face interviews. Then there was a change in technology and researchers in uh, developed countries realized starting around the 1970s that instead of traveling to people and asking them questions in person, we could actually call them on the telephone and ask them. So here we have a change in technology changes a way that survey data is collected. And so we switched from area probability sampling as the dominant technique to random digit dial as the predominant technique. So we randomly dial phone numbers. And then instead of talking to people face to face, you talk to them on the telephone. And so when this transition happened, it was actually highly contested. Researchers said, oh, we don't really know how to do random digit dial correctly. There's actually a bunch of tricks, techniques, and it wasn't until really, I believe 1979, that Waxberg and Matowski published their paper in the Journal of the American Statistical Association that worked out the formal technical properties of uh, random digit dial as we know it today. Um, and then people said, oh, on the telephone, uh, I don't know, people may answer differently than they answer in person, and this is true as well. But eventually researchers did a lot of research to figure out how do people answer differently on the telephone versus face-to-face. -face. And basically researchers decided that they, Advan the advantages of using new technology at that time, the telephone, um, were immense in terms of speed and cost. And so we had to figure out how to do sampling and interviews using these new technologies. And we did those things. And so now we are entering into the third era of survey research. And the third era of survey research will be, um, this is a little bit less well established. These are sort of my view of the third area, and I think other people's as well, that this third era of survey research will have much more non-probability sampling, and I'll say in more detail what that means. Um, second, instead of having interviews that are done by people, either face-to-face -face or over the telephone, we'll increasingly have computer-administered data collection and then I think there's a third dimension that gets added in when we think about what the third era of survey research is, which is how the survey interacts with the larger data environment. So in the first two eras of survey research, 
the, the survey was largely uh, a standalone thing. And I think increasingly what we will see, given the abundance of big data sources, we'll start to see surveys that are more clearly designed to be linked to big data sources. So I think this bottom row of this table here, this illustrates uh, what I think we will see in the third era of survey research. And in this series of lectures, I'll talk a little bit about each of these three dimensions. Before doing that though, I wanna talk about one very, very important idea from the first two waves of survey research that I think carries over very well and helps us think clearly about how to assess some of the possibilities in this third era of survey research. So this is the total survey error framework. It's basically an entire framework for thinking about all the things that can go wrong in surveys. That's hence the name total survey error framework. So this often helps a researcher uh, organize the things that, that she should be concerned about and helps make trade-offs. That is often in surveys, we want to have the smallest possible error uh, for a given cost budget. And so the total survey error helps us think about all the kinds of errors that can appear and how they trade off based on our design decisions. And there are, I think, two main insights that come from the total survey error framework. The first insight is that errors can come from both bi from bias or from variance. And so let me, this picture I think of the targets helps illustrate that. This column here that says low variance, this will be on your uh, right. Um, you can see that here, this first cell, low variance, no bias. You get all the, all the shots are hitting right in the center of the target. That's great. You can see as bias, uh, here we move to a low bias procedure and a high bias procedure. The, the um, estimates are getting further and further away from the center of the bullseye. A separate dimension is variance, which is measuring sort of how tight these estimates are around the truth. And so here you can see high variance estimates with no bias, high variance estimates with the small bias, and high variance estimates with the large bias. And so when you're thinking about errors, you should try to think about whether they come from bias or variance. And then also it's important to realize that the lowest error might not come from an unbiased approach. Social scientists generally say we want an unbiased approach and then we'll take the one with the lowest variance. But it's often the case that if you're willing to introduce a small amount of bias, you can dramatically reduce the variance. And so you can end up reducing your, uh, your error. And so <clears throat> if as a researcher, you have to choose between this uh, approach here, which is low bias, low variance, and this approach, which is no bias, high variance, it's not obvious to me that you would always want the no bias, high variance approach. And in fact, in this approach with a small amount of bias and a small amount of variance, you're actually closer to the truth um, more often. So again, the first insight from the total survey error framework is that we should think about errors coming from bias and variance. The second main insight coming from the total survey error framework is that errors can come from measurement errors or representation errors. So let me explain what I mean. This figure comes from uh, a paper by Groves and Lyberg. And so basically survey researchers, you can think of two main buckets of problems. So one bucket comes from measurement. This is roughly how you are able to learn from the people that you're talking to. And then there are problems that errors that come from representation. These are roughly errors that come from the fact that you talk to a sample of people and you often wanna make inference about a different population of people. And so errors generally can come from measurement or from representation. So one of, and, and often when we have confidence intervals on things that come from surveys, these confidence intervals often only include the error that comes from sampling. They only include representation error and they typically don't include measurement error. So as you're thinking about your survey procedure, you should think about what kinds of errors come from the measurement process and what kinds come from the representation process. And now let me illustrate this with an example from a recent, um, uh, surprising result from survey research. So this is President Trump at his 2016 inaugura inauguration. Uh, and as many of you know, the polls prior to the election had predicted actually that Hillary Clinton would win the election. 
And so after the election was over, after Trump had won, despite what the polls had predicted, APOR, which is the American Association of Public Opinion Researchers, like a professional association of, of survey researchers, formed a committee to try to evaluate what happened in the 2016 election polls. And here is what the committee um, concluded about these polls. So national polls were generally correct and accurate by historical standards. State level polls showed a competitive, uncertain contest, but clearly underestimated Trump's support in the upper Midwest. So then the report goes on to say um, what specifically they think went wrong. And as I read these, think about the total survey error framework because these specific examples fit into this broader framework. So the, again, the APOR report uh, about the 2016 election says there were a number of reasons as to why polls underestimated support for Trump. The explanations for which we found the most evidence are first, real change in vote preference during the final week or so of the campaign. So here, surveys are not gonna be able to pick this up. If the thing that you're trying to estimate is changing, then you can't expect surveys to know that. Um, now here's the part that gets more into the total survey error framework. Adjusting for overrepresentation of college graduates was critical, but many polls did not do so. So this is a kind of a problem that comes from representation. So the, the People that were included in these surveys over included college graduates because they were more likely to participate in these polls. And so researchers needed to adjust for this over representation, but they did not do it correctly. So here we have an example of a problem in representation. Also, some Trump voters who participated in pre election polls did not reveal themselves as Trump voters until after the election, and they outnumbered late revealing Clinton voters. So here we have a problem with measurement. That is, among the people we talked to, we were not able to measure the thing that we were trying to measure. And so you can see that for this particular case um, of the 2016 election polls, the way that you can think about the errors that happen break down into errors that are related to representation and errors that are related to measurement. And you can read the full report at the link below on the slides. So wrapping up this uh, lecture, the total survey error framework, the first key insight is that errors can be caused by bias or variance. The second is that errors can be related to representation and measurement, both in other words, who you talk to and what you learn from those people. And the total survey error framework also helps us think about how the digital age can create new opportunities for who to ask and how to ask. And those are the things that we'll see more clearly in the upcoming videos. To learn more, I definitely recommend this book by Robert Groves et al. This is a book uh, about survey research entirely organized around the total survey error framework. So again, this was the first video in a series of five about survey research in the digital age. Thank you.